All right. Um, it's two o'clock here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I've got a couple of people online, uh, somebody local here. So again, if uh, you know, uh, if you guys are online, if if there's a problem or you can't hear me, you know, speak up. Uh, let me know. Uh, I got the recording on here, so I can post this up. So. Um, So yeah, I had two main things. You know, as, as usual, I'm I'm um, happy if people want to ask questions uh, to go into the things that are on your guys' mind. Um, uh, I did want to maybe take ten minutes to go back to uh, talk about a few things on the problem set too. Um, so I mean, I kind of consider this an important one. Um, so I hope everybody took a, a chance to go back and kind of read through. Especially the second question. So we're going to add the this this little bit of code for the threads. We're going to be coming back to in the next unit as well when we talk about uh, concurrency issues. So it's kind of important that you um, grasp sort of the, the the point of this question here. And and a lot of people were really only getting it at a surface level uh, that we're answering uh, these questions. Um, but um, I just wanted to show one or two things. And, and like I said, I'll, I'll try to keep it to, to just five or 10 minutes here, um, just to point out the main things about this. So I went into this a little bit. So, you know, one thing that at this point in the class that you should understand is, okay, so we, we've got multiple threads in this process running. So, so once we do the pthread create, there's actually two threads running, uh, but, um, and then you should have read chapter three and chapter four um, at this point, basically getting ready for our second test here. Um, but, you know, everything that we talked about for the processes, in the, the, the state transition diagram for the processes pretty much applies also when we're, when we're have thread and when we're mad, when the operating system is managing it at a thread by thread level instead of at the whole process level. So you have the same thing. So in this case, you know, we've got two threads, which you can think of as separate processes. They could be in different states. So that that's kind of important. So and and you know what's happening with the sleep call? I I, I um, hinted at that uh, last time, but uh, I mean it's really an example of a system call. But this causes the process uh, to go into a blocked state. So it's not blocked way on I/O. What happens is a timer, an interrupt timer is set. Um, I'm I, I I think an interrupt timer is set. Um, it, I mean it, I'm just guessing. It might be some other way it does this, but, but something like that. So like a timer for a second um, is set. The, the thread is put into a block state um, and then, you know, control returns back to the operating system. So the operating system then, so normally what happens when you run this is the operating system, uh, when this, for example, if this thread blocks on sleeping here, uh, the operating system rega regains control. It wants to dispatch, dispatch another thread to run um, on the CPU. Um, that was just freed up. So, you know, it might select the other thread in the same process to run. Um, so at that point, you know, this thread also might have been blocked or it was back into a ready state. But but uh, after another thing, you know, so after the, the, the sleep, the, the timeout occurs, the operating system would translate that thread from the block state back to a ready state. Uh, so at that point, you know, these threads would be in the ready queue. Um, and when the, the uh, operating system selects that thread to run again, they will start running from that, that, that next um, instruction after where the sleep occurred, right? Um, you know, so, so when, when they're re-dispatched, uh, given the CPU again, they pick up where they left off. So the, the, the and then um, for this particular program, this particular example of the thread program, the this is an example of a, a type of race condition. So this is really a concurrency issue. So typically what happens here, you know, so again, a lot of people weren't very clear on pointing out the differences, you know. So in this thread, we just directly, you know, this basically reads the value out of my global, adds one to it, um, and saves the result back into my global. Okay. So you, you should think of my global as. Uh, being assigned some location in memory, so, so some uh, address in RAM that holds the value of my global, right? But for this thread, we, you know, we, we do the same three steps, 
But, you know, when we read the value out of my global into a temporary variable J, uh, we add one to it um, and assign it to that temporary variable J. And then we assign the result of that increment back, but not until after we unblock, not until after, you know, so we end up blocking for a second or more uh, before we actually do the assignment. So, you know, as one or two people got, but not everybody, I mean, the, the typical thing, the reason why you get 21 a lot here is because what happens is, for example, this first thread runs, uh, the, 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 the thread function runs, it gets, let, let's say my global is currently zero. So it gets zero out to J and it signs one into J, but J is local to this function, right? So, so there's one in J, but that's separate from my global. Right, and then it blocks, and then typically that gives a chance for the other thread to run. So the other thread does a similar thing, but but remember, my global still has zero. So it it reads the value out of my global, adds one to it, and assigns it back. So now my global has one, and then you know this um, the the main thread blocks, uh, and then typically what happens is we um, end up going back to the other thread. So the operating system schedules the other thread. It continues on from this point. And it assigns J back to my global. So that just assigned, remember, J has one in there. So it just rewrites one over my global. So one gets written back into my global twice, typically, when that happens here, right? So, um, and the point of this, you know, I couldn't say give too much of a hint, but, but the point of this is that um, if what you want is both of these threads to be incrementing my global, we're, we're losing some work here. And this is kind of an example of, a concurrency issue, so so they're um, interfering with each other. If the task is to you know successfully increment the my global variable every time, or one time through the loop here, all right? So I mean the typical. I mean before you, you've read about concurrency and locking mechanisms and things like that, the the typical obvious answer or way to fix this is well let's just change. We need to get rid of that long wait between reading the value out and incrementing it and then writing the result back in there. And then we won't have the interference, right? Um, and that basically works. So, you know, um, uh, as a solution here, as far as, as we know here. So let, let me show that. So if instead of doing this, we do exactly the same thing in the thread. as we did um, in the main function, right? So I'll just modify that like that. Um, and I'll leave everything else basically the same. Uh, I'm sleeping for a thousand microseconds to, instead of one second here now, but. So if we run it, we'll see, you know, that uh, we get uh, 40, right? And typically you could run this a lot and it'll pretty much always be 40. So it seems like it's fixed, right? Um, and even if we make this delay like real small or, let's, or even get rid of it, I'll, man, let's leave it a little delay. So, so if, if we sleep for a really small amount of time, we're still going to cause the process to, to go into a block state, which gives a chance for the other thread to, to be scheduled, um, although it'll sleep for a much smaller amount of time using a very small micro sleep um, here. So we'll see that that um, um, sometimes uh, it's, it's a lot more uh, uh, um, likely that one thread keeps getting run. So even though it blocks, um, it gets rescheduled to run again instead of the other thread being run. Um, you know, so so there's nothing that guarantees uh, that these get um, um, exactly. You know, um, uh, um, what's the the word I'm looking for here? That that we we act exactly interleave these, right? That would be another thing. If you really needed these, that always the one thread ran followed by the other, and then they trade back and forth, that would be another thing that you'd want some sort of a lock um, to, to enforce that. But we're not enforcing anything that 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 makes them run more after the other. So, But um, I'll point out here, then you can think about this. It'll be the last thing I'll say here about this problem set question, unless somebody wants to ask some a question about it. Um, that we really haven't fixed the problem because even though in this high level language, this um, this line of code like here that I've got in both places now to increment my global, or even you know uh, even there wouldn't be any difference even 
In C++, you could do something like this, um, do use the increment operator. All right. So, but for both of those, I mean, even in the, the high level language, we were using the increment operator, I was doing like an assignment, but really this gets compiled down to more than one machine instruction. So typically what it gets compiled down to is like a load instruction where we where we load the value from my global into like a register. So, so if you know anything about, if you're taking our computer architecture course or done some machine language programming, typically, you know, my global is gonna be in main memory. So we need to load it into a register. So we would transfer, transfer the current value from main memory into like a register A, B or something. Then we would have an add instruction to like add one to that register. And then, then a store instruction to get the result back out uh, into the shared my global here, right? So um, that would, if, if we would go and look at the compiled uh, machine assembly language of this um, program, it would probably be something like at least those three instructions to do that, right? Um, and, the, and, and, you know, so the point is those instructions aren't atomic. So, so even though this makes it much less likely that we'll see the problem, you could still get interrupted in between. So, I mean, I can still like load the value from my global, but then, um, my, my thread would time out or for some other reason would get interrupted by the operating system. And then we would switch over to the other, um, thread. Um, and we would get the same uh, concurrency issue, the, the same uh, race condition, right? That, that I just kind of demonstrated here, right? So, I mean, the real way we need to fix this is we need to have something like a semaphore or a lock and get, consider the access, the, the manipulation of this global resource as a critical section and then put a lock so that we lock the critical section before we manipulate my global and then unlock it after we're done manipulating it. So, um, and I'll just point out, although, like I said, it kind of looks like it's fixed here, but if you, oops, if you run, you know, many more loops, so if, if I do each one for half a million times, I don't know if this will be enough, and it'll also depend on what machine, you know, what the CPU is on your machine, whether it's likely or not, um, to see this, but but if we make it you know half a million each, we would expect that the the global the the final result should be a million, right? Um, and I'm going to actually get rid of these uh, output statements so that we don't get a bunch of stuff going on the screen here. Oop, all right. So um, hopefully that's not too long. So even, I mean, a million shouldn't take that long, even though I'm sleeping for a little bit every time on here. Hopefully on my first try, it'll uh, um, demonstrate what I'm talking about here. Actually, I'm a bit surprised. I thought I'd come back a bit faster than that. Uh, let's try a little bit smaller. Should have done this ahead of time. Checked it. I thought a million wasn't at all bad on this. Did I make too many zeros on one of these now? So, you know, so, you know, there we didn't see any. So we got a hundred thousand as we're expecting. Um, Again, I don't know if, if I'll be able to show this, but uh, if you do this enough, you will eventually see that um, sometime it will hit that race condition. You won't get exactly a million. So there, I finally got to, to hit one. So one time it got interrupted in between the, the machine instructions to actually increment my global and we lost one of the updates there. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to show that. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments on uh, on the problem set two before I move on here? It's a good thing to understand. So I think it'll help 
help you um, if you uh, think about that a bit when we start talking about concurrency and semaphores here next uh, next week, next unit. So. All right. Um, so besides that, I mean, my main goal was to talk more about assignment four. You know, this, so this might not be, we'll see. So if you have any, anybody has questions, you know, we can go um, up for the full time here, although we might not end up taking the full time. Um, I can get it started. So, you know, hopefully everybody has, um, did I say on, on our second assignment, our, our second program assignment? So we got started talking about it last time. I, I, I was thinking about filling in some more details, um, see if people had questions from working on it. So, yeah. My goal is returning a reference to standard template libraries list every time I identify or what I'm going to do. Right. So the question uh, was um, returning a reference to a standard template library um, container, like a list or something, right? Um, and um, it, it depend on. Um, the, the function there you did. And so one thing I was going to point out, I mean, um, um, this is related, I think, to your question. Uh, let's see here. So, so I showed this a little bit, or at least I barely began working on this. So one of the main problems that you might run into is, um, uh, like, yeah, I mentioned this, is that, uh, you know, if, if you define these uh, in different ways, like if you have an array of processes, you have to you have to worry about whether I'm making copies of things or not. So, um, um, and and yeah, similar thing can happen. So, do you have like a function that uh, returns a container or? Um... Well, this was in the test at line the test set on line two sixty six. We call it increment foster CPU cycle. Okay. After the dispatch. It specifically during the dispatch, what you do is you get the processor ID, or the, the process ID. And once you have that process ID, you use that to get the process. You get the process and takes that process ID, iterates over the list. It's the processor, as we defined this processor the whole block there, iterates over that and returns a basically let me know that instance. Unfortunately, what's happening is that. When I create any type of iterator, it returns a copy of the first instance rather than the instance itself. So uh, basically, I end up with not altering anything that's actually in the process control block list, but I end up altering a copy. And then that copy gets passed back into the main functions. And then when it says, okay, now I want to set you to, I want to make sure you're running. Well, I set that copy to running, but then it's, uh, it's not accessing the original. Yeah. So um, I'm not 100% certain that this is exactly the same, but, but uh, th this is common. Um, if you're using um, process, the uh, process control block, like I was showing here. So, um, so yeah, so 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 a common thing that might happen is let, let's let's look at like another function here. So if you do something like uh, for the the um, um, let me think of a good example here. So although I would expect it to be a little bit later on here, but um, at this point, yeah, I mean, process one, uh, if you're doing everything correctly, after doing three CPU cycles should have been um, um, in the running state and had run like three cycles and done some stuff like that. So if you're not careful in, um, uh, let me see here. For example, um, uh, I'm 
look at the CPU event here. Um, so I'm gonna kind of give a quick example of, of, of what I'm trying to, to get at here. So like in CPU event, um, I mean, you have to have somehow, some way of knowing what the current um, process is that's running on the CPU. So I didn't show that before, but, um, you know, um, so you need another thing as well. So, so like, Um, so if you just define a member variable to hold the, the, the current process that's, that's actually executing right now. Um, it, it, it depends on how you do that. So, so like um, uh, in the, um, the, in your dispatch, then if you do something like, um, Get the process from the front of the ready queue. So, so this, this will illustrate a little bit. And again, I'm not 100 percent certain this is exactly uh, what you're running into. But uh, right now, the way I started off last time, um, we had started showing um, that the the queue was a, a queue of process identifiers. But you know, so you might have been tempted to say your ready queue was like a queue of, of just process objects. Um, so in that case, you might, um, you know, use the, the normal standard template library thing to get, uh, what is it like, like pop front or whatever the queue is, um, can't remember here, ready queue. To get like the the item off the front of the queue, and then I guess pop that off to remove it. Uh, but yeah, things like this. Um, since the ready queue is a queue of processes, um, this actually makes a copy. So, so we're we're actually passing things around by value. Um, so so copies happen when you do stuff like that. So, you know, um, if I then say, you know, that the, um, the current running CPU is, again, we have a copy of that, right? Um, and, you know, um, we would have to say, we would have to make that the next running process. Um, something like that. But uh, everything I'm doing here um, is gonna be problematic, uh, uh, especially um, if I'm also keeping things on the process control block. So, so I'm really making a copy of the process out of my queue. Um, uh, so a local copy here. Um, and then I end up making another copy in order to assign it to be the process that's running on as the current one on the CPU. And then when I call the dispatch function, it only, um, actually uh, does its work on that on this instance right so if um my my object uh is is process one um and if that that i later look at what the state is of the process one you're going to find that um nothing has happened to it on the process control block because it has um um um, uh, when when we did the the dispatch like this, uh, we were actually doing it on uh, like a copy of the process, right? So I mean, you do have to handle that. Um, um, and uh, I discussed these, but didn't really show these kind of last time. Um, to me, 
one suggestion is to only have one place where you ever have actual instances of the processes like this array that I call a process control block. And then everywhere else, like in your um, ready queues, uh, in your block lists. Or whatever um, um, your the, the particular process that's the current run running on the CPU. Um, just use the process identifier. Uh, and yeah, doing it that way, then anytime you need to actually get an access to the process, you'd have to, um, you know, use that as an index uh, into your array, right? So, so if you do go by an approach like that, um, for example, when we do the um, dispatch, like I was showing here, the thing you get off the front is not a process, it's just a PID, which is a simple unsigned integer, right? Um, and you know, and this will work too. But we're just copying the integer instead of the whole pro, the whole uh, whole copy of the instance of the process object there, right? Um, and then here, if I needed to actually do things with the process object, I you know I can you know the, the here the 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 current process on CPU is also a PID the way I just did it, a process identifier instead of an actual process. So if I wanted to call dispatch on that, I would have to de-index it. So I'd have to get it from my um, Like that, right? So, so here, um, since the process control block is the only thing that contains instances of the the process objects, um, I can get you know a reference. Uh, though again, I got to be careful. So this the this is another illustration of what I'm talking about because what I just did is is uh, even though I read it out of the table, the assignment like this makes a copy. Um, so I'm really making a copy of the process. So, so again, you'll find that it wouldn't work um, if we called dispatch on that. You know, so I really need to directly call dispatch on the actual process entity in my um, table there. Right. So, so that that was a real, even more subtle uh, in. Uh, demonstration of the problem there right so so if you, if you first put it into a temporary variable you're really making a copy of, of the whole process instance and then if you call dispatch on that you would end up um, setting the state to be running for your copy but you wouldn't actually be affecting the one in your table so so here I, by, by just directly calling it on the, the process instance of my table I, I know I'm affecting that one that I got uh, in my table there um so that's one thing that definitely trips up a lot of people and again i don't know if it's 100 of what you might be seeing or not it might be something similar to that um another approach i've seen um is to use a table of process pointers so if you're if you're comfortable with uh, dynamic memory allocation um, you could use like like you could use process point, pointers dynamically create a new process in the new uh, event um, and and put the pointer to that item that you dynamically allocate. And then then it's safe to to pass around uh, pointers um, because it's kind of similar to the using a process ID. Um, same idea, but I'm using actual pointers instead of an index in the table. Uh, but but yeah, I, I could just put the, the pointer to the to the process in the control block onto my ready queues or to my block lists. Um, when I dispatch those, I can just keep the pointer to that um, on you know keep track of of what the current process is, if any, that's running on the CPU, that type of thing. So, um, and then yeah, in those cases, if you're using pointers, um, you know, you'd be getting pointers out of, uh, if, if, if you have pointers on your queue, you'd be getting pointers out of your queue. Um, and, but yeah, since that's a pointer, you know, if I wanted to call like dispatch on whatever it's pointing, the process that it's pointing to, I'd have to do um,
you have to dereference it and uh, um, then you know call the member function or whatever to um, uh, work on the actual instance that all the pointers are pointing to. So. Um, So, oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you guys, you got to talk up a little bit, uh, you to un unmute and do stuff. Sorry about that. Yes, I don't have my, sh my screen saved there or uh, shared there. So uh, let me share that. Um, all right. So did, uh, um, did that uh, seem like related to, or do you think it's different that you were running into? Yeah, it's related to what I, the last two, the four blocks, and I'll get into the next one, is what I use the list for. Okay, right. And that was, I would think, that part. Yeah, did you use like a list of what? Um, just process instances. Uh, yeah, so you can get the same kind of thing um, um, here, right? So what you're saying is you search through this. So, so if you have to find the one process ID one, it might not be at a particular location. So you might have to do like a loop to, to find process ID one. Uh, right. Um, uh, yeah, for, so for a typical, if you're using like the old style C++ iterators, um, you get like pointers to the objects in there, I thought. Um, Um, I don't know if I pointed this out before. I, I tend to use the um, the uh, C++ dot com. It's a pretty good reference um, if you need references to the standard template library stuff. Um, so, for example, yeah, if we're using a list, um, So, so yeah, there's there's kind of newer style iterators. I try to avoid using these old style iterators, but uh, but yeah, if you're using like uh, a list over process iterator, um, um, it's going from my list begin to my list end, or whatever you call your list. Um, um, yeah, that thing you should get in there in your iterator. Um, if you dereference that should be the instance, but yeah, if you're returning that, it might be, it, it, it would probably make a copy of, of that thing. All right. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. So I might not be completely, I mean, thinking about it here. Yeah, if you found the one with like a PID of one to return that, but like 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 here, if you were using that, and you found the one with process ID one. Uh, but then, if you dereference that to like modify it, like dispatcher or what, that I would think that that would be affecting the one in your list, processing your list. So, no, what I did was that process one. Mm -hmm. So if you have process ID, right? Right. So then you create the that way, it is a point of it. So, we spent that today. But also, while I'm working last night, I finally figured out to check the user. 
address that we just need to do so this file data that says we can add this. So the address is all. So it's just a reference to a different line. Before I left the function, I helped you stream address the other individual uh, initial history of those two different start of the iterating history of this process one and since both of the process completed and we have nothing else. Right. Um, so I'll just leave that to Ray. Yeah. Yeah. So um yeah, you might want to try a different approach. So, you know, um, but yeah, this is something that, uh, that the people have to think about, right? So the cleanest thing is to try to make certain that you've only got one actual instance of your process. Um, and then, um, um, so, and, 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 and yeah, kind of like I'm hinting at here, the um, cleanest way to do that then is, is uh, whatever your whatever your container is or array that holds the proxy, everything else you use pointers or process identifiers um, for your queues or keeping track of things and always use that to index in or, or uh, reference into your um, actual um, objects. Um, uh, well, let's see. Okay, so uh, questions from anybody online at this point as well you want to ask about? Um, I can say, yeah, I, I can uh, see here. Uh, a couple of things. So, I mean, you know, I know that not everybody is familiar with standard template library containers. Um, um, uh, having used C plus plus a lot, so uh, I believe there was a, a video where I kind of talked about like lists and queues and things. Um, and uh, again, you can also find all that code on um, the example subdirectory. I believe. I'll bring that up real quickly. So. Um, so in our um, dev box, in the um, example, again, there should be this STL has the kind of the standard template library examples that I went through. So if you're unfamiliar with those, you know, you, know, you really should be using um, some lists or queues or things for the ready queue and the blocked list or things. Um, so for example, like in the queue stack, um, example. Uh, one thing, uh, so um, you might want to use a list instead of a queue. You can use a list, uh, you can treat lists um, like queues or stacks. So a, a regular list in the, the standard C++ standard template library has push front and push back um, and like pop front and pop back. So, you know, if you want to treat a list as a stack, you just push things onto the front and then pop them off the front. Um, if you want to treat it as a queue, you push things on the back and pop them off the front. Right? So, so, so you can treat it either way. The reason why you want, might want to use a list is you can iterate over a list, whereas if you use one of these queue um, containers, one of these, it's, it's a, um, uh, what's the technical name for it? It's really, it's really kind of just a wrapper container, um, but uh, queues don't really allow you to uh, iterate over them. So, you know, right. So there were some examples of that in the videos. So, so if you need to iterate over all the values in the queue, uh, you can just define it as a list instead of a queue, you know, so a queue of PIDs or a queue of process pointers or something like that. And that will allow you to do old style, new style iterators. So, so things like this, you know, so, so, so string queue here is actually a list but I can iterate over all the items. So one by one, I can get the strings out of string queue and um, display them. The reason why you might want to use a list instead of a queue um, is, 
um, um, I go back. Let me go back and open up the um, assignment two here again. So um, at the end of this assignment, if, if you get all of the uh, tasks finished, um, there is, uh, in order to get the system test passing, you do have to do kind of one final thing on this one. So there, there's uh, a little bit of extra work um, to get the full system test working. Um, some particular, so I showed this before, but um, uh, here on the output from the simulation, we get like a list of all the processes uh, so we get the process that's on the CPU, we get the, a list of all the processes that are currently in the ready queue. Um, so like if we have two processes in the ready queue, we'll see them listed, you know, from the top one is at the head of the queue down to the bottom one is the tail. But, but again, you know, so if you're using a queue instead of a list entity, um, um, you can't really iterate over a queue, but, but you do need to be able to iterate over your structure um, to display all the things on your ready queue or you know, maybe on your block list or something like that. Um, so, so using a list uh, instead makes it easier, makes it easy to, to iterate over the items, especially for like the ready queue um, and do that. Um, So yeah, and maybe just you know to make that a little bit more concrete, since, since I'm thinking about it. Um, so let's say that we're doing this, but we're using. Um, so I'll show another hint here about displaying stuff like that. But let's say we're just using process IDs for our queues and lists of things, and we're using a um, um, an array of the actual process instances in our process control block. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, if we use this as a list, you know, we, we could still we could do the push on the back of the ready queue to push a process ID on the back of it, and we can. Uh, um, pop front um, to uh, 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 remove the item off the front of the ready queue, basically treat this list as a ready queue, right? Uh, but the other thing this allows us to do is, um, so for the, the final, um, um, the final system test, you are gonna have to add a little bit of code to the, um, the, the two string method. So the, the two string method is where this is described in the assignment description. So the two string method is where all that output that you see um, in the result um, from running the simulation comes from. But but you do need to add in some stuff. So in particular, for example, you need to add in um, some things here to display the contents of the ready queue. So um, If my ready queue is a list of process identifiers like this, uh, I can iterate over all the process ident identifiers in my ready queue one by one. Um, although we might be careful, I can't remember right now. So, um, um, this will iterate over it from back to front. So um, you might have to treat the ready queue in the right direction. Uh, or else you might have to figure out how to do a reverse iteration over this, if, if you're following what I mean there. So anyway, this will give you in, in, in one order or not. Uh, there might be, you might have to do this in reverse order here. Um, but um, So kind of the solution that I've been showing you there, you should be able to do something like that though, right? So, so, so I'm, I'm getting PIDs out of there. 
Uh, these processes can be streamed to output streams. Um, so, you know, again, if you're not familiar with C++, you might want to look through the, the process um, object. But uh, in particular, though, we overload the streaming operator uh, for processes. So that allows you to do things. So, so basically, um, If you stream it out, if you stream out a process, it, it, it puts this output onto the stream. It's, it's PID, it's state, um, the time it started, how much time it's used, and, and these other things, right? So, um, so yeah, some, something as simple as that um, would allow you to stream out. Um, um, and get the output of all the things on your ready queue, ready queue. Although you know you might have to do that in reverse order or um, some other kind of manipulation like that to, to get them in the, the right order from front to back, going at the top to the bottom. You know. um, another. Things that maybe I'll mention that you might want to think about learning or trying out um, on this one is um, um, you might want to think about using like a map instead of like a list or uh, something for the, the block list. Because what you really want for the block list, um, uh, so a, a map is a uh, what are called uh, dictionaries or hashes in some languages. Uh, so it basically allows you to arbitrarily um, associate a key with a value and, and look them up. So insert things into the map, uh, uh, insert keys and associate them with value and, and, and retrieve them. So re retrieve a value associated with a particular key. Um, so um, let me see if I can get a... Good example of, of it, you know, so a basic one. So here we're mapping character keys to integer values, right? And that allows you to uh, insert things in. So, so you can insert things basically using kind of the square brackets, so as if it's an array, but the keys can be things that are non integers. And then the values can also be non integers. So, so you can associate a character with a character, a character with a string, or something, something like that. So uh, anyway, if we have a map of, um, 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 something like say event ID to process identifier. So then whenever we block something on a particular event, uh, we could add in to the map that um, the thing waiting on event ID, whatever, five um, is this particular process, right? So, so the blocked, um, Um, map would allow you to do things like um, whenever we get a block event, we're given the, the uh, event ID So whatever you call it, whatever. So if you're using PIDs, um, for whatever, keep track of what the current thing running on CPU is. We can associate that uh, now that I've, the, the, the current process that's running is, is being blocked on that particular event ID. So we've kept track of, of that process or the process ID uh, that's uh, uh, associated with that event ID that's blocked on, right? Um, and then when we unblock, um, you know, we could look it back up. So, um, Might have to put some in some error checking in here, um, you know. Um, although I don't think we ever have any simulations where we like have an unblock on an event ID where there's a process not waiting on that, you know. So, so uh, that probably shouldn't happen. But um, but yeah, you know, if you look it back up, this directly gets you out which process was waiting on that. Um,
and then you can access it uh, in your um, process control block, whatever, get, get your actual instance of the process object and do whatever you need to do to unblock it, put it back onto the ready queue, uh, maybe whatever. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, if you use a map, you can iterate over a regular map. So um, I think I'm, I'm kind of mentioning that uh, because um, um, you might not get all your system um, tests to pass because the, the system tests, I believe in, in the reference implementation uh, outputs the block list uh, in order of the event ID. So in, unless you want to try and go and uh, you know use like a regular list and sort them up by event ID, you might not be passing the system tests. Although if, if you run into that, don't worry about that. So you know if you just want to use a regular list and search the list or something, that's fine. Uh, if, if you want to take the time to learn the maps here, uh, but uh, but yeah, from from that, if you do use a map, then um, if you iterate over the maps. Uh, should be an example of like uh, iterating over these. Uh, so the regular maps should come out in order of the keys. So you'll get the, the smallest event ID first. You know, so here when we put in keys B, A, C, uh, regular maps come out in order. So there's it's really not a map isn't using a hash. A map is using a, a binary tree of some some kind um, so that you can uh, iterate over it in order. Uh, if you use an unordered map, that actually uses a hash table. If, if, if you remember your data structures uh, stuff, and 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 if you iterate over an unordered map, uh, they don't come out in order like this. But um, but yeah, anyway, um, that would allow you to pull the things out by event ID, and then you can display them in the uh, the output of the things that are currently blocked, the process that they're currently blocked. So. Um, okay, uh, let me see. So I'm probably going to um, open it up again then for questions. I, I had, didn't have any more hints that I was thinking of. There's just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, does anybody come on, bring up anything? Um, and if you have your stuff, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Or you know, anybody that's listening to this, you know, I'll be happy to you know send me if you send me code. Um, you know, I'll be happy to look at it um, or even run it if you send me the whole process simulator.hpp and cpp file. Uh, run it and give me comments on that. So, let's see here. So, anybody have any um, things? Or um, want to ask about it here? Any assignment or anything else? Yeah. We need to worry about this process in the bank stage. We encounter in three processes and process uh, one becomes blocks. And then we can run a process two and process three to take the time when the process three starts. The process three needs to resource the process one and it's waiting on um yes yeah, good question so um the, uh, the the question really pertains to um can uh more than one process be blocked on the same event uh basically i think and you can correct me um, but but so that's one thing that doesn't happen in these simulations so you don't have to worry about that so that's one reason why you can probably use the map because you will never have uh, you only have uh one process waiting on a particular event ID. So, um, so, so I, I think that that's kind of what you're asking about. So, so if, if, if process one is waiting on event five, process three should never end up also blocking on that same event ID. Um, right, the way I was saying it's the same thing. You would need the map, you would start the map. You would need to uh, and so when you unblock it, you do need to remove it from the map. So, so, so if, uh, yeah, if something was waiting on event ID five um, and it unblocks on that, something else could then come along and also later on. So, so, so yeah, you would, uh, so, so after getting it out of the map, um, you have to call the thing to remove that key value pair from the map. 
um, on the M block. Right. So um, it, the, the simulation should, should never have that state occur. So basically, uh, if event one comes in and, and blocks on, on um, I'm sorry, if process one comes in and gets blocked on event five, they, they should, you can have a mapping from event five, um, uh, process one is waiting on event five. Um, so it should never be the case that another process uh, comes in and tries to also be blocked or waiting on event five if something's already waiting on that event. So, um, it, 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 I mean, the simulation should never end up trying that out. Um, so, so you don't have to, you don't have, don't have to handle that case where multiple things are waiting on the same event type. Um, so, so yeah, if, if event one um, blocks on uh, if process one blocks on event five, it's going to be in a block state. Um, nothing should ever wait on on event five until an unblock happens for that event five, and with, at which point it really needs to be removed from your block list. So that so that something else could then um, um, block on event five as long as nothing else is waiting on event five. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, it's almost three. Um, I mean, you know, uh, we actually do have till like three thirty. I think is scheduled. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and close up the session unless anybody wants to ask a final question here. Um, otherwise, uh, let's go ahead and end that for today. I'll let you guys go. I'll post this. Feel free to send uh, you know questions as you're working on getting the assignment, uh, the second assignment here finished up and stuff. Uh, I'll see you guys later then.